How does your brain work? It's a question that has challenged philosophers for millennia, psychologists for centuries, and neuroscientists for decades. And the big debate comes down to this. Is there a section of your brain for every behavior and process, or is the brain one big adaptable neurological play-doh? Is it all for one and one for all, or not? In the red corner, arguing that the brain has specialized zones for specific tasks, Peterson et al. scanned participants' brains whilst they were reading or being read to. Similar tasks, but different enough. What they discovered is that when reading the words themselves, the participants' fMRI scan showed activation in a section of the brain known as Broca's area. But when listening to the words being read by someone else, the participants showed an activation of Wernick's area. Anatomically, these are distinct and different parts of your brain. Ring that bell. Round two. All the way back in 1848, Phineas Gage, a railroad worker from New Hampshire, accidentally charged an iron rod through his brain whilst using dynamite at work. The rod destroyed most of his left frontal lobe, but Phineas Gage survived the accident. However, following the accident, those close to Phineas said that he could no longer hold down a job and had become unstable. Could this be because the frontal cortex plays a key role in social behavior? Anecdotal, but another score for cerebral localization. <laughs> Round three. Coming back fighting from the blue corner, Lashley created lesions in rats' brains after teaching them how to run in a maze. However, no matter which part of the brain Lashley lesioned, the rats were still able to complete the task. Is this because a complex task like a maze uses different localizations anyway? Or is all of the brain involved all of the time? The debate continues. And rats aren't humans anyway. But London taxi drivers are. Round four. In the year 2000, Maguire et al. studied the brains of 16 London cabbies and discovered an increase in grey matter in the posterior hippocampus compared to a control group. The posterior hippocampus is involved in short-term memory and spatial navigation. So, in the immortal words of Lady Gaga, were the taxi drivers just born that way? or had their brains adapted to their environment? In order to answer that, let's look at the human brain at two moments of development. At birth, each neuron in the cerebral cortex has around 2,500 synapses. By the age of three, this has shot up to 15,000. Throughout life, connections within our brain mature as we weed out the connections we don't use and strengthen those that we call upon frequently. This neural pruning is strong supporting evidence to suggest that our brain's capacity is not fixed at birth or by nature's design. Your environment and experiences can shape your brain. In a study similar to Maguire's taxi drivers, Michele et al. discovered that learning a second language leads to an increase in grey matter density in the left inferior parietal cortex. The extent of this grey matter development is mediated by factors such as how fluent you are and how old you were when you learned the language. So these results seem to back up the idea that experiences develop our brain to flourish in the tasks that we expect it to perform more frequently. For taxi drivers, that's spatial awareness and short-term memory. For linguists, it's semantic and auditory skills. Each study lends its support to one side of the argument over the other. However, it might not be so entirely clear-cut. It is possible that certain areas of the brain are biologically enhanced for certain tasks from birth, whilst environmental factors can develop the brain beyond its natural limitations. You decide, but that fence in the middle looks good to me. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to Psychology Unlocked for more on the fascinating world of psychology. If you have any questions or comments, I look forward to reading them in the comments below.